Good morning, everyone. I'm John Kennedy, Head of Product for 3D Engines at AWS. Today, I'm going to talk about the lessons and processes I've learned working at Amazon for three years and in a startup for eight years prior to that. Specifically, I'm talk going to talk about how to pitch products using uh, Amazon's unique uh, document writing process and customer research process. Um, if after this session you want to learn more about Amazon's working backwards process, I highly recommend uh, the book Working Backwards uh, by, Bill, by Colin Breyer and Bill Carr. It contains many of the lessons I will talk about today, uh, and it will give you more context behind the Amazon uh, writing process. If you're even more interested in the process, uh, Maybe you want to consider joining our team. Uh, if you have game industry experience and product experience, I have a role open right now uh, for a product manager and the, the link is there. Uh, or if not, uh, we have plenty of product manager roles open at Amazon at the moment. Uh, you can find them at amazon.jobs. I realize there is some irony in explaining how not to use PowerPoint in PowerPoint. Writing documents for pitches is not for all companies and not for all situations. It works really well at Amazon. It can work elsewhere, but it takes commitment and process change for most companies. Docs, are docs usually take more upfront work than presentations, but they can significantly accelerate decision-making processes and give teams much more autonomy after an approval or a successful pitch. I'm not going to talk about the doc review process today, which deserves a webinar unto itself, but it is important to note that to make the doc writing process effective also takes a rigorous doc review process. By the end of this session, I hope that you'll understand some of the advantages of a doc driven pitch process. Um, and you know what you should take away is our research process, how to get the most out of uh, customer conversations, uh, what you need to get started uh, before you start writing, and how to write a pitch uh, in the Amazon style. So if you're currently at a startup trying to pitch your product, you might be wondering whether this is the right session for you. The process I'm gonna talk through is a product process that operates on a large scale at Amazon, but it is also the process that I would use if I was running product at a startup today. I actually came to Amazon from being director of product management at a startup. I observed the Amazon doc writing process while working with Amazon on a partnership and knew that I wanted to explore it further. Amazon PMs are constantly pitching. Every major feature or new product at Amazon has to go through this process and so it has been refined with a multitude of best practices. The question, questions answered in an Amazon PR FAQ uh, are the same that you're likely to be asked by anyone you're pitching to. Amazon execs operate in a similar way to the best type of venture capitalists, rigorous review with significant authority after approval. Amazon execs want documents that give them all the context they need to make a decision, similar to anyone thinking about investing in your product. At Amazon, a doc is owned by one person. And before I talk about customer research and writing, it is important to know why Amazon prefers single threaded owners for docs. There is a culture of thinking big at Amazon that makes um, <coughs> that means that a single PM <coughs> can pitch for a Series B level of investment. Amazon trusts this process because the doc writing and review process is thorough. The PM is in charge of doing the customer research, taking all the inputs from internal teams, writing the doc, scheduling the reviews, and rewriting the doc based on feedback from each review. This is a significant amount of work. I give each of my PMs ownership of only, only one doc at a time, and, and it is their top priority. One of the outcomes of, the, of writing the doc uh, in this way is a clarity of vision. Documents owned by one person are much more likely to be internally consistent based on strongly held beliefs, and uh, making one person a single-threaded owner significantly improves quality through accountability. Docs are a lot of work up front, but if the doc can drive a solid decision, then it can avoid months or years of adjustment of the product vision prior to launch. I'm not against product pivots, but the best information you get tends to be, it tends to come after you launch the product. What can happen at companies that give approvals based on limited research is an initial period of uncertain development resulting in thrash or waste as the vision is adjusted. So let's talk about the research we do. 
the primary questions we're asking when doing the customer research are who is the customer? What is the customer problem or opportunity? What is the most important customer benefit? How do you know uh, what the customers want? And what does the customer experience look like? Every pitch, uh, every Amazon pitch starts with customer conversations. And in fact, the minimum bar uh, before I would take a doc uh, to review by, uh, by parties outside of my group would be 25 uh, to 50 customer, uh, customer conversations. Um, that's great. Uh, those customer conversations lead to relationships and that's great for product launches because you can end up uh, with a number of customers invested uh, in your product uh, prior to launch. So let's talk about how a PM can work with other parts of the business to build uh, the product pitch and do that customer research. The first thing a product manager has to do uh, to talk to customers is actually set up uh, a list of customers they want to talk to or set up a, a pipeline. And the people who know how to do that best, of course, are sales. Uh, sales can be a great resource for product managers wanting to work out how to set up more customer conversations and getting in touch with customers. It could be that you're working with an enterprise sales team and that will be one set of processes. Um, it could be that you're working with a lean SaaS sales team and that would be another type of engagement. Uh, or you could be a product manager who also wears the sales hat, uh, in which case you need to switch hats. But in all of these circumstances, it really pays to understand the sales mindset. A gap uh, that I, I see with a lot of uh, product management is rigor around, uh, around this process of setting up uh, customer calls and customer conversations and building customer relationships. And so what I do uh, for my PMs, and in fact, you could just use a CRM for this if, if you want, but what I do with my PMs is I get them to set up a pipeline of customer conversations, a shared spreadsheet in our circumstance, or for us, uh, that uh, where I can see uh, all of the customers they intend to contact uh, and talk to. Uh, without this kind of mechanism, it's hard to maintain the two to three customer conversations per week uh, that you'd need to get through, uh, to get through the research. The next thing you're gonna need is a good way to encourage customers to talk to you. And that's the hook. Uh, you know, so the hook is something that you could use if you were, uh, if you're going to cold call, an email, a cold call a customer or send a cold email or have a chat to someone at a conference. Um, it could be something, uh, it, it could be something that you give to a salesperson to offer to their accounts uh, to encourage a conversation. Really the purpose of the hook is to enable you to uh, to set up a time, you know, 30 minutes to an hour where you can uh, have, uh, have structured time with a customer where you can, uh, you know, um, actually go through a set of questions that can give, give you the answers that you need. So, um, you know, salespeople have, are brilliant at coming up with a hook, um, but I also give my product managers a little template uh, that they can use uh, when setting up a hook. And so, um, you know, it's important to respect customers' time and expertise. Um, and so often it's good to start uh, with, with, um, with that respect and, and also by giving them some context. So we're investigating a topic area or a problem space and recognize that you're, you are experts in this area. We're considering uh, building a service to solve the problems in this area and we would like your input. Then you can offer value. Uh, so with your participation, we can ensure that the service will be built to solve your problems uh, specifically. And this is actually uh, really attractive to a lot of customers who have uh, problems in the problem space that you're thinking about and would love them solved with a, with a product that they can use. Um, and then there are also bonus benefits you can offer. Sometimes you can offer gift, gift cards. Uh, you can also offer early beta access to the product. So when you're having your first conversations, what you're really needing to do is problem discovery. And if you want to know more about problem discovery, uh, there's a great book called Spin Selling, uh, specifically for sales teams. Um, you know, I've, I, I think about adapting that process specifically for product to, uh, to discover problems in a space that we're, that we're researching, uh, where the product has, actually hasn't been built yet. So, uh, you know, I've taken the example of, uh, of uh, storage uh, as the problem space uh, for this example, uh, I was previously working uh, as the principal product manager on AWS Storage Gateway, so this is a fairly familiar uh, familiar territory uh, for me. But uh, these are some of the open questions that you could ask someone when you're when you're doing problem discovery in a particular problem space uh, for storage. So, how do you store your data on premises today? 
this is meant to elicit a story from customers. Uh, it's meant to get them talking and uh, talking about their process and their challenges. Um, you should be able to start to hear themes as they, as they, as you kind of do research across multiple customers to see what's important to customers. How did your data move from on-premise to the cloud? Similar kind of question. Um, you know, asking about a specific process. And once you hear more about that, you might dive in further. Um, asking what types of data do you store and for what purposes? This is once again, just broadening uh, the view of, of, uh, of why they're uh, storing data. This could be implied to any kind of problem space. You wanna make sure that you go broad and open up conversations to elicit stories. And what this should result in is a set of free form customer notes. But as you're going through these initial conversations, it's also important to gather email addresses uh, and quotes from the customer. The email addresses are great. You wanna build a relationship. I think you know, it's pretty reasonable to contact a customer every couple of months to build that relationship and potentially set up follow-on uh, uh, in, uh, you know, meetings with them to do further investigation as you're further down the track to solve the problem. The quotes come in handy later when you're writing to, uh, to be able to model the voice of the customer. The next, next thing you want to do once you have a set of problems is ask closed questions to determine the value of each problem for each customer. And this, you're really asking questions that, uh, that are quantitative here. So you know, a good example would be how much data do you store on-premises in the cloud? Or uh, how much do you pay for your on-premises data infrastructure each year? And the how much do you pay kind of question is often really hard to get out of the customer, but it's gold when you get the answer. So it's often worth asking. How large is the team that manages your data infrastructure? This is a great question. Uh, if you want to apply it generically, what I'm asking is team size. And, uh, and that's so valuable because a lot of products are going to re uh, reduce uh, the, or they're going to automate and reduce the amount of, uh, you know, uh, manual work and the amount of uh, people it requires to, to solve a particular problem. And so by asking team size, uh, you're really able to, to start to understand the value you could provide in terms of reduce, reduced headcount for, for a particular problem for that customer. Um, and and that, uh, that translates pretty easily into dollars. So after this, you should end up uh, with a table uh, where you've kind of asked these questions, uh, you've got uh, quantitative answers, uh, you know, and you can start to see averages uh, across uh, the answers. So you can determine the value of particular problems uh, to, to customers. So once you have, uh, once you understand the value behind, uh, behind those particular problems, uh, you can then go to engineering and start to talk about what is viable to solve. You know, what can we build with a small team and meet a need that customers care about? So when you're working with engineering, uh, you may not actually have a table like this, uh, but this is an e easy way to think about it. So you've kind of determined the problem, you've maybe determined the percentage of customers that uh, care about that problem and the value per customer. But with engineering, you can start to understand how long it's gonna to take to build and the number of people it would take uh, to, to build that product to address that problem. Once you've kind of come up with your theory about which uh, one of these products is going to be uh, the, the best ROI, uh, you can uh, then dive a little deeper with engineering to come up with a, a tentative estimate for a product roadmap to give you a little bit more firm of a timeline and then a team size uh, and uh, to make sure that you're, uh, you're accurate uh, with your estimates, and uh, you can put that all into the PL later on. So the next step, once you've kind of uh, once you've worked out viability, is to start working on the messaging. And marketing uh, are great people to work with on the messaging. Marketing have a broad view of the market, the market size, um, and also the language that will resonate with buyers. Uh, and an effective mechanism to do this is is a structured. Um, what, you know, working backwards messaging framework. So there are really a number of questions you put in a, another table that are very simple, it can be answered easily, um, you know, and in conjunction with marketing. Uh, so, you know, some, some examples would be uh, type of organization, end user, problem statement. And then there's a grid of nine I like to use to divide up the major problem um, into, into its parts, into its most important parts uh, within the messaging framework. And I'm not going to uh, be exhaustive in, to kind of examine all of the parts of a messaging framework we'd use at Amazon, but, I, but uh, you know, I'm going to focus on a couple of the really important parts that will help you write the PRFQ later on. 
So the first part of that grid of nine is the top three customer issues. And once again, I'm going to use the example of storage here. Uh, so let's break down the issue of uh, customers need to need to uh, access uh, data on prem into a few different issues. Um, on prem uh, on premises storage is limited. Some data sets need to be accessed both in the cloud and on-prem and on-premise data infrastructure is a management burden. So, you know, what you're doing here is taking a very customer centric view, understanding their top problems. There's probably five or six or seven or more problems the customer has, but by finding, by, by narrowing it down to the three top problems, uh, you're really ensuring that you, you hit on the top value when you're writing your document uh, that customers will connect with across a broad spectrum of customers. Once you've got your issues, you can then connect them with features that will fix those problems. Uh, so you can see that down each column, uh, we've got a connected set of issues uh, and features and, and benefits, which we'll get to in a second. So feature one that could fix the problem of, uh, of limited storage on-prem is cached access to cloud uh, cloud data, as an example. Uh, and once you've got these differentiated features, uh, the, the final part of the, the three by three grid is the top customer benefits. So, you know, that, uh, that uh, on-premise data cache is going to give you un unlimited on-premise data storage. Now, each of these boxes you filled out, I filled them out with one sentence. And generally what happens is you'll fill them out with a whole paragraph each, um, but it's good to eventually get to one sentence that really defines the, uh, the issue the benefit, uh, sorry, the issue, the uh, feature, and the benefit. Um, this is going to help uh, help you with writing the document later on. So absolutely fine to keep in your paragraph or more of data inside the, the issues and features and benefits. Um, but by the end, you should also have, you know, the kind of one sentence summary. And then uh, additionally, in the messaging framework, it's good to have a get started section. This is going to help you with your writing later on. It doesn't need to be connected to those columns. Uh, it could be three or four steps or uh, or more, but three or four steps is a good number. Um, and this uh, this gives you a little bit more clarity about the product because once you start kind of diving into how the product is used, it gives you a better technical understanding of what the product is and will be useful for customers later on. So, you know, once you've kind of brought all those elements together, uh, it's time to start, uh, it, it, it's a good time to work with uh, finance to think about the overall viability uh, of, of the product. Uh, you know, finance can help you put together a profit and loss to really determine your uh, return on investment for a product. And you can build in all of the, uh, the pieces that you've put together, including headcount costs and infrastructure costs and sales and marketing costs, all these kinds of things, um, you know, and, and everything that we've created up till this point uh, should actually go, including this PL, should go into the documents appendix. Uh, you know, a peer FAQ should be about six pages in total, um, but often we'll have 50 pages of appendices uh, behind that with the supporting information, all that information we've been gathering in this process of working with customers and, you know, the customer log and, and then all of the uh, partners that we've been working, working with up to this point. So now we're ready uh, and uh, ready to start writing. And maybe we've come up with a draft peer FAQ, uh, you know, uh, press release and frequently asked questions document prior to this point. Uh, but all of this information is going to make it a lot easier that we've gathered uh, to, to start writing. And, uh, you know, the point of a, a narrative document at Amazon, and it could be a, 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 the structure that I'm going to talk about today, which is the press release and uh, frequently asked questions structure, could be a different narrative structure. But the, the point of writing at Amazon is really to lower the cognitive load for, for, for a decision maker so that they can make a decision quickly and have all of the information available. And some of the style points when writing include, uh, you know, that we, uh, we don't use jargon because that, that would increase the cognitive load. Uh, you know, we want to be technical, um, but without, but uh, without necessarily using, um, you know, industry jargon. So it's easy for any anyone to understand. We, you want to remove. Uh, it's important to remove unnecessary adverbs like extremely or very. These don't actually add very much, <laughs> um, but uh, but but they do kind of cloud um, cloud the message. It's important to avoid negativity. You don't really be talking about uh, competitors. Uh, you know, and it's and it should be appropriate for C-level customers or uh, technology trade journalists. That's kind of who you should be thinking about uh, uh, pitching to in this document. It should be completely comprehensible on its own. It should have correct terminology usage, grammar, spelling, pun punctuation, and it should be reflective of what's planned for the initial launch. 
uh, not aspirational because you want to be able to determine whether what you're going to originally initially launch is going to be attractive to customers. So let's get into it. So the structure of a working backwards press release, I've broken this down into all the paragraphs and the PR and then the FAQs. And actually points one through seven here all fit into just about the one page. So, you know, the first page of the six pages, the FAQs should take up the other five pages. And I'll explain why that's important uh, a little later. But let's dive into the structure of the, uh, of the press release to start with. So uh, it starts, uh, you know, just very simply with header, subhead one, subhead two. Um, and, uh, you know, these could be, uh, th these should be very simple. They should be the kind of the key customer benefit. Uh, you know, if we were going to think uh, about the example we've been using, such as Storage Gateway, we might say, you know, um, AWS an announces uh, Storage Gateway, but in fact, in your document, you should use a code name. Um, and this is, using a code name is really important because it takes away bias uh, when people are thinking about your product and you're researching your product and you're kind of, you're bringing it to them. If you give a descriptive code name, uh, you know, that has the word storage in it, even, uh, you know, in that problem space, it really biases them to, to what they think the product is and will do. So coming up with a code name is really important. There's lots of schemas to come up with, you know, uh, of, of uh, product code names, but it's important that the code name really has nothing to do with the product. It's just something arb arbitrary, like, uh, you know, a uh, spice or a herb or, uh, you know, a sci-fi spaceship or something like that. The subhead should be your kind of single uh, single sentence complete value prop. And then another uh, subhead, it's great to talk about the ideal customers uh, you would want for the product. So paragraph one um, has to be the complete summary. Uh, you know, when you're writing a PR, it's often that execs will only read paragraph one. So you've got to include everything there. And I've got a little template here, but to give you an idea of what it might look like, if I was actually to kind of play this out and replace uh, the placeholders here, it might be something like, uh, you know, uh, Seattle, December 1, 2023. Today, AWS announced AWS Storage Gateway, a hybrid storage appliance that makes it simple for IT administrators to give users, users access to unlimited data storage on premises. And, and that's kind of the first sentence. It just lays it out, what it is, what it does. Next sentence, um, you know, let's talk about the value. So customers can use AWS Storage Gateway to enable symmetric access to common data, data sets on premises and in the cloud through a range of protocols, including SMB and NFS. So I've given some detail, I've given the value prop, you know, a key takeaway. Um, and, and then I might dive into some of the facts. Uh, functionality. So I might say something like uh, with Storage Gateway, it's easy for customers to manage their storage appliance with all updates managed by AWS and administration by their via the AWS console. Really condensing down the message that I'm going to talk about later on uh, into this first paragraph. And then it's good to round it off just with how to get started. If your product is not a, a, a SaaS or uh, you know a service like we would have at AWS, you might you know have something to download or install. Uh, but for AWS, obviously, uh, you can activate everything from the console. So you can just say something like to learn more, get started, uh, visit, uh, you know, amazon.com slash storage gateway or something like that. So the next paragraph focuses on the problems. Um, you know, it starts with a top level problem. And then we're going to take the issues that we built in the messaging framework and we're going to actually uh, create a paragraph out of them. So, you know, it's important to know that you can't quite take the issues verbatim. I couldn't quite create a complete PRFAQ generator because, uh, you know, you have to actually tell a story. It has to be a narrative for it to be easy to read. The points have to flow together. So it might sound something like this, um, you know, for the top level problem, we might say something like more and more customers need low latency access to increasing amounts of data on premises, desktop applications and high performance computing are generating petabytes of data that for the most part is, uh, is stored on premise in large storage, ar storage arrays, something like that. Um, and then for the, each of the issues, you could go on and say, you know, for maybe issue one, these storage arrays are limited in size by their hardware and the available space on site, meaning that each time a customer runs out of storage space, they uh, must undertake significant planning to upgrade, slowing down the user processes and ultimately limiting innovation. So you see I'm capturing uh, the point in, in a narrative se sentence or two there, and then I'm leading on to my next sentence, which should be the next issue. So something like much of the data generated will also eventually need to be accessed in the cloud for backup, further analysis, or used by cloud applications. The process to move this data from storage arrays can be time time consuming and eventual access in the cloud may not be consistent with the access protocols on premises, complicating a, a, a application migrations to the cloud. So I've tried to join up uh, the sentences, but still maintaining the issues that I've laid out. 
And then the final sentence might be, in addition, on-premise storage arrays require ongoing maintenance and physical security at each location. So the next paragraph is going to be the solution. And we're going to connect, uh, you know, with those issues. We're going to make sure we address those issues with a combination of the differentiated features coupled with the customer benefit. So the, the, top, the top sentence in the solution paragraph is just what the product is and the, and the top level customer values. So something like, uh, you know, AWS Storage Gateway is a managed hybrid storage appliance that gives customers symmetric multi-protocol multi access to unlimited storage on premises in the cloud, right? So what it is, customer value prop top level. And then you can start to connect your features and your customer benefits into sentences. So something like storage gateways managed on-premises VMware appliance provides an on-premises cache ensuring low latency access uh, uh, to unlimited storage uh, on-premises for users, something like that. Uh, so you see I've connected up the feature and the benefit um, and, and address the issue that we've mentioned in the previous paragraph. That should flow into the, the next sentence. So similarly, I could say something like, the appliance is connected to a cloud service that provides access by the same protocols to the data in the cloud, including SMB and NFS. And you'll notice that I'm going the layer down in detail now in these. So I'm giving a little bit of extra information to interest the customer a little bit more in each of these uh, features and customer benefits. Um, so final sense could be something like uh, storage gateway is managed by the cloud, by the, uh, the uh, in the cloud, ensuring that customers can set and forget the appliance uh, and automatic maintenance windows can be set up to ensure that storage workloads are never interrupted at critical critical times to the business. So once again, just expanding, uh, you know, that uh, that on that uh, feature and customer benefit issue in the, uh, addressing the issue in this paragraph. So from there, we're going to have a leader quote. And uh, this quote is meant to capture the value provided to the customer, really the why. It speaks directly to the main benefit, the value proposition, the differentiator, but the tone should be humble and focused on the customer. Um, and the, the big difference here is that the, the, uh, this, kind of, this paragraph, this quote is conversational. And you know, one of the great advantages here is if you have a top level approver who's gonna approve this, they can be the person who uh, you know, is cited in this quote. And so by putting it in their voice, uh, you can really uh, connect with them and they can, of course, adjust this quote in the review uh, and really put their claim, uh, you know, put their stamp on, on the, the pitch. Uh, so final paragraphs of getting started paragraph. As I mentioned, when we're talking about the, the messaging framework, the getting started can really just dive a level down into the technical detail. So, uh, you know, so a customer or a user or an engineer understands a little bit more about how uh, the product is meant to operate. So I might say something, and this, this doesn't have to have an overall summary. This can just be step-by-step. Step. So I might say something like, to get started with AWS Storage Gateway, customers can install the VMware appliance on premises at each location where they need access. Uh, and then the next step is something like, then they can connect the Storage Gateway service to their authentication system uh, via their AWS console. Uh, finally, they set up file stores by connecting Storage Gateway to storage buckets in the cloud. These file stores will now be accessible on premises via the appliance in the cloud within the selected VPCs. Really simple, but just gives the next level of detail down. The customer quotes are really important, and you can actually use the quotes you got during your research to speak in the customer voice. What you want to put here is that the customer quotes that would apply after the service has been launched. Um, and actually, the way I think about it is I bring customers into the beta period and they can give me these quotes. And they'll be actually quotes that I get from customers by the time we launch the product. So two to three minimum, uh, but it sh should cover each of the major uh, issues sometimes, you know, so usually have three issues. You could then create three quotes from three different uh, customers um, and they should be believable written in a human voice, but they should also address the particular business issues of that particular customer. So let's talk about the, the FAQs. Um, you know, the FAQs, uh, by the fact that they're written uh, to the customer, um, they, they mean that there's no extra context there. And as many of the FAQs as possible should be written to the customer. We're going to talk about internal FAQs in a minute, but most FAQs should be external. And the first set are just a set of five standard questions. What are you launching? Who should use it? Why should they use it? How do they use it? Uh, how much does it cost? And these are pretty standard across all uh, products. But then you, then you get into the interesting questions. And these are the questions you will have been asked later in the research as you kind of solidify your vision around the product and as you have ongoing uh, you know, conversations with customers uh, and repeat conversations with customers, they'll actually start to ask you questions about the product. And that's, that's exactly what should go into this se section. They should also, you should have a set of questions describing the major features in detail. So it really, really gets those. Um, and to explain the major assumptions 
uh, that you made when you're working with sales, marketing, engineering, etc. Then you should have, uh, then you probably should end, uh, you know, with a set of internal FAQs to describe things that you can't actually describe externally. These might include market size and competitive offerings, pricing research, details of proprietary technology, and and a, maybe a summary of your PL if you need to bring that in to the first six pages. So at that point, uh, you know, by the end of the, the FAQs, you should be at six pages or fewer. Um, it's very infrequent that we'll end up with less than six pages. And the reason is that we usually blow out to eight or nine pages and then have to shorten our writing and, uh, you know, maybe cut out some of the less important questions. Um, so finally, just uh, briefly on timelines, uh, it's, it's incredibly variable how long these will take to create. Um, but, you know, given a, a cadence of two to three uh, interviews per week, it's pretty reasonable to get uh, all the research and writing done within a three-week period. And then it really de de uh, depends on the size of your organization, uh, talents that it's going to take to go through peer review and executive re review and approvals. So uh, that's it. Thanks for attending. Um, you know, that's all we have time for today. Um, but if you're interested in this process and you're interested in product, uh, product management, uh, you know, please reach out um, if you want to join the team and you have game industry experience. Um, or if you just have questions about the presentation, you can reach me on, uh, on via email or LinkedIn or Twitter here. Um, and thanks for coming along.